that great scholar and Christian statesman, the Apostle Paul, said, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Today we are going to think together about that subject which is most true, most honest, most just, most pure, most lovely, and of best report, and that subject is Christianity, facing together the basic question, what is Christianity all about? What is the genius of this amazing message that we have come to believe? Now all of us are aware of the existence of God, and we also know of the sovereignty of God. The Bible teaches that God is that infinite and eternal creator who made the heavens and the earth. And Christian theologians speak of God as being omnipotent. That means he possesses all power. As being omniscient, he has all knowledge. And as being omnipresent, he is everywhere present at the same time. And the reality of God is one of the most obvious facts in all of life. The scripture teaches that we are responsible to know of and to believe in the all-powerfulness of God because of what we see in his creation. In the first chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So a person is without excuse. That is, he is responsible to know God, whether the Bible spoke of him or not. The existence of God is supposed to come to us as a fact obvious in nature. So the sovereignty of God, while it is the basis of all things, is not the real point of Christianity. Christianity didn't come just to tell us that God presides above human affairs. Now all of us are also aware of the sinfulness of man. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But even if the Bible didn't say this, we would be aware of tragic shortcomings in man, both by examining ourselves and also others. So it is that every automobile accident, every crime, every psychiatric clinic, every hospital, every cemetery tells us of human limitation, tells us that we have come short of real perfection. Therefore, by examining the circumstances of life, we should be aware that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now, where did this awful stream of human sin begin? It began when Adam and Eve, our first parents in the Garden of Eden, who were made in the image of God, and the Bible does say four times, by the way, in two verses, that man was made in the image of God. It began when they exercised their free moral agency. And that, by the way, is the essential sense in which we are made in the image of God. We are given the power of choice. We are free moral agents. They exercise this freedom in favor, not of God, but of anti-God. They said no instead of yes to the will of their creator. And as a result, the Bible says, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So the fact of human sin is a most obvious fact of life, and it comes to us in every circumstance of our experience. So we have the sovereignty of God, a fact of life. We have the sinfulness of man, a fact of life. But how do we connect these two? Ah, I'm glad you asked that question, because the connection between these two, this is what Christianity is all about. The Bible teaches that God, seeing the sinfulness of man, took the initiative. He took the initiative in many ways in the Old Testament scriptures by calling prophets and leaders and finally a whole nation to represent him. But the ultimate initiative to make a contact between his own perfection and the lostness of mankind was made by God in the form of a person. The name of that person Jesus Christ. The Bible calls his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God becoming one of us. God becoming like we are. So when Christ was born in Bethlehem's manger, the incarnation, that great miracle in all history, became the touchstone between God and man. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He demonstrated this both by his words and also by his works. In his words, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. 
He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am. He also, by his works, demonstrated the truth of his words. Jesus worked miracles. He caused the blind to see and the lame to walk and the dead to be alive again. But of course the miracle that is the ultimate demonstration of the deity of Christ is Christ's own resurrection, for he was declared to be the Son of God with power by means of the resurrection from the dead, the Bible says. Now being the Son of God, what did Jesus do to make it possible for us to be reunited with our Heavenly Father? The answer is, he allowed himself to be taken one day to a cross. And on that cross, the scripture says he died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So in his death, Jesus Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When he gave himself to die for you and for me, in our place and stead, as the theologians say, he opened every blessing of heaven and made it available to you and to me. The Bible says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are complete in him, in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now how does this every blessing, how does this completing come mine? It becomes mine by a marvelous step which God has given me the power, the ability to take. What is that step? That is the step of faith. So the scripture says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the apostle Paul says, I delivered unto you the best news in all the world, the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, how that he was buried, how that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and by who he was and particularly by what he did for us on the cross, Jesus Christ makes it possible for the marvel of God himself to become my personal possession. So the scripture makes a most amazing statement about a person who believes in Christ and it says he is partaker of the divine nature. He has the privilege of prayer. He is a son of God. He has the wonderful opportunity of a daily walk with God. He is a partaker of the divine nature. Now bear in mind the importance of that little point that God is raising sons. And the second chapter of Hebrews tells us that God wants to bring many sons into glory. This is the explanation for every problem of life. We are called upon to bear burdens, to solve difficulties, to learn lessons in order that we might grow in a moral sense because it is God's intention and therefore our personal destiny to arrive at heaven as mature sons ready to move into our eternal joys and responsibilities, ready to be as sons of God, the people Christ died to make us. There's a verse in the second chapter of Ephesians that says that God intends through the ages of eternity to show the riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The genius of Christianity then is that God has taken our burden upon himself. God has chosen by his death to give us life everlasting and to make us sons of God. Christianity then alone is the way by which a person can achieve eternal purpose, the way by which a person can discover the fulfillment for which his heart longs. Therefore, to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, and then to commit your life to be that Son of God, that God the Father and Christ the Son wants you to be, this is the beginning of the richest, the most wonderful, the most fabulous and thrilling life you could ever know. In this world, you are able to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Therefore, infinite possibilities are yours today. The most fabulous experience in all of life, then, is to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Believe me, this is the beginning of discovering your destiny.